its holy place to bring a sacrifice of praise bow down before you and seek your face we sing of mighty things you done cry out to you let your will be done tell all the
See you high and lift. 
Come. 
Right now we're going to go to the Lord and we're going to serve him in a very unique fashion. How many are unique and special? Raise your hand if you're unique and special. How many think you should lose that when you come to know Jesus? No. Why is it then that so many people or so many ministries or churches or religions in the process of discipling, they think that you're supposed to change who that person is? They try to make clones out of them. You should do it this way. And you know, every one of us learn in a fashion different. Every one of us are unique individuals. And if we are unique, why do you think that that is? I believe that it's because that's the way that God created us. God wants us to be unique. If we weren't designed that way, he wouldn't have made us all individual. We would have all had the same fingerprints. We would have all had the same color eyes. We would have had all of us the same appetites and the same desires to be able to, to do certain things, same talents. I would be able to play the piano like Neto if that were the case. But the reality is, is that I can't. The reality is that we are all unique. We are all different. So contrary to what's taught by many religions, God does not want us to remove this uniqueness that we have. Rather, he wants to come along and he meets us where we are and he transforms us into his image, but we are still going to be who we are. Every one of us are going to be unique. Every one of us, our ideas are different. I've met some people that their ideas are very different. And many people think that my ideas are very different. And this last week, I had an opportunity to be in a, uh, a special presbytery meeting. And one of the presbyters, actually two of the presbyters, uh, simply said to me, well, you have unique ideas, was what they said. And uh, so I, I, I said, thank you. I don't know how they, interpret, how they intended it, but I said thank you in the process. Uh, and so here we are. We're going to see how God can use our uniqueness. Because if we lose our uniqueness, God's not going to be able to use us the way that he designed us to be used. And so we're going to analyze the lives of a couple of people. First of all, this last week, we read in the first chapters of Luke a couple of texts. And I was focusing, as we were reading in the same chapter, the difference in the personalities, the difference in the ways that they were thinking and the ways that they responded to the word of God between Zacharias and Mary. As, as this one priest, he was old. You know, none of us can, uh, can relate to that. He was old. But nonetheless, God was going to use him. His life's work was already set. He was a priest. He didn't have a future that he was saying, I can't wait for this to happen. He was saying, I know who I am already. He already had his identity. He knew what he was going to do. As a matter of fact, he thought he understood the purpose of his family and even of his wife, Elizabeth. And knowing that, God still broke through. Zacharias was a very practical person. How many noticed that about him? He's very practical. And I don't know why Gabriel was so frustrated with him for just saying, you know what, how can this happen? Give me some sign that this is real. Because he's a very practical person. The very nature of who he is is practical. And you know what? I've, I discover that the more you deal with people, the more practical you're going to be. If you're a priest and you're serving as the priest and you're going in and doing these things, later on you have to go out and explain to the rest of the people because that's the job of the priest to be the intermediary, to be the go-between between God and man. And so he has to explain the way God is working. He has to receive the offerings, and he has to be able to prove what's going on. If he doesn't have that physical offering, 
it's not going to take place. Somebody could come and say, you know, I, I meant to bring an offering. It's just like, I don't know how many of you have ever decided that the best option was to put an IOU in the offering plate. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. The electric bill does not accept IOUs. It could have the best of intentions, but the reality is, is that the IOU, it's fine, thank you for informing us, but uh, really we can't do anything until the offering actually shows up. You, uh, I can write to our missionaries that we, we serve and are, and are serving the Lord on the foreign fields or even on the local fields, uh, indigenous peoples, and say, oh, this month it was a little tight, we owe you. You know what they're going to say? Thanks for remembering but the reality is, is that Zechariah had this uh, personality that said, I have to have the proofs. Because if the blood is not there, if they don't see the blood, it doesn't count. And so this was who Zechariah was. So let's go to the text as, as we're indicating in Luke chapter 1. Here's what it says. It says Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 20, but it starts in verse, why does it say 20? But I believe that it's actually verse 5. That's just a unique way to, uh, of, of delineating lines, I believe, because on here it says 20, 21, and then it's verse 7. So it's just the lines. Don't worry about those numbers. In the time of King Herod, or of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron, so both from the priestly line. Both of them re were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. In other words, they know the law. Their relationship with God had been established and had been established for a great period of time. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Now, that's how come I could say he was old. Scripture says it. It doesn't just say he was old. It says that he was very old. They were both very old. You know, they, it reminds me, I guess, of the story of, Ab of Abraham and Sarah. And God's going to come along and do something. And once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before, the God, before God, in other words, he got the, the, the lot drawn on him. His division was there and they chose him. He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him John. Now I want to pause right there. When did Zechariah pray for a son. Sometimes when you read through the text, you get this idea that he was just praying. And so God heard him. But they are old. No, they're very old. They're old. So was that prayer a current prayer? Or was that prayer something that had happened 15, 20, 30 years in the past? Probably it was that. Probably when they were first getting married, when they were first in this, in this idea, when all of their friends were having children, when, all, when, when their parents were saying, when are we going to get grandchildren? And no child was coming. The, uh, Zechariah and, and Elizabeth were gathering together and they were praying, God, give us a child. We need this child. Please, God. But I don't believe that it was in that week when they were very old that Zechariah was praying, God, and please give me that child. Remember, I'm still, you know, there's times when every one of us have a dream, but there's the realities of life, and we kind of leave those thoughts behind, and we leave the ability to even pray for that thing because we've lost hope of that item. And when you lose hope for the future, that's when it's very difficult to accept without proof. That's when it's very difficult to accept without proof. And so 
He goes along and he says, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, you will call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back all of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and, to, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, said to him, or said to him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So that's what the scriptures say. I'm fi I find it interesting, and you know, later on it says that the people were outside waiting and wondering why he was taking so long. <laughs> Could you imagine? Yeah, there's a little bit of pressure. I'm supposed to go in. I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to go back out. And if I stop moving for any length of time, they're going to start pulling me out. So I need, to st I need to make sure that everything is according to the plan. Right? And so you can imagine that he wants to have the conversation with Gabriel. He wants to get the information. But he's also very cut and dry. Very to the point. How can I be sure of this? Make sure you tell me how to do this. Just like uh, last night, we had a night of worship. And uh, last night was the first time uh, some of you that were here noticed that the camera was placed there. And, and uh, I guess Joshua went over to uh, Nancy and told her that it's being live recorded and, and people are seeing it in Hokotepec or other places, I'm not sure. And that put so much stress on her that all of a sudden, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, it's not a job I'd want to do. I don't do it well. My wife tells me every time I'm stuck doing it that I don't do it well. To move the, the PowerPoint. Because I start worshiping and I forget where we're at. And I don't know the words already. Why bother to move the screen and, and so forth. And, and, uh, but so she does a good job. She does a great job. But last night she was so stressed. Going back and forth in the English to the Spanish. She came over to me. I was over here, and she said, it's terrible. I lost it. You're going to have to come over and help me. I said, you're fine. It's fine. And she said, but it's being recorded. And I said, the camera doesn't even see the screen. At least I don't think it does. I didn't set up the camera, but I don't believe it shows the screen. And she said, oh, really? Okay. Then. And she went back over, and then she was still so stressed that she had to get Maida to help her. Just a little bit of uh, thinking people are waiting on you. Just a little bit of thinking that it's different. You know, uh, it can add stress to you. And I think maybe that was a little bit of what was going on with Zechariah. He all of a sudden gets the lot pulled, and he has to go in. And he goes into the, the presence of God, and all of a sudden there's this angel. And he has heard comments from other ministers, other priests, that have come out of the, the presence of God, and no one said, oh, I saw an angel, and he told me things. Right? This was a unique moment. And he sits there, and he says, he's startled. He says, what do you want with me? Right? And the angel says all of this stuff to him, and he just says, how can I be sure of this? Just help me. And the angel says, excuse me? I'm Gabriel. Do you remember me? My name's listed, and you memorized some of it. I'm the one that always sees the face of God, and you're Questioning whether I'm telling you the truth? I mean, that's literally what he says. And you can imagine <laughs> the same Zechariah who was just told, don't be afraid. When the angel says this to him, he says, uh, and he continued to do that because he couldn't talk. And everyone was waiting outside. And he goes outside, and he can't talk. And everyone says, what happened? And he's, he's showing signs and, and, and trying to imagine what was going on in, inside. And no one can quite grasp it, but they know something is happening. And that was Zechariah's experience. Now, Mary was a very different person. Mary, although being different, is still going to be used by God. 
Now, Mary is a young girl and dreamed of the future. You see, her prayers were still for what was going to happen. There was never going to be a time where if you come to that teenage girl, Mary, and say, are you praying for a good family? And she's going to say, no, I haven't prayed about that since for years. No, because it's all in the future still. So her situation is different. And so she has all of the faith of a child. God can do anything because she's still learning about God. She's still learning about the power of God. People are still teaching her. She's not yet got to the place where she says, I know it. I've experienced it. I've seen how many gallons of blood flow on that altar like, or that sacrifice as Zechariah would have. She was this novice, if you will. And this is what was happening this last week in our presbytery meeting. The, uh, we have five presbyters in our district. Three of them are brand new. They haven't been presbyters before. And two of those brand new ones were there when I first got there, and, and nobody else was there. And they simply looked over at me, and they said, How? What? What are you doing? And I, what are you talking about? I responded. I said, well, we were all there at the district council, and how all of your region just loves you. And it... it, it, it not to, it's the reality. It's the reality. Every other region had to have at least two candidates to be able to have it a fair election. Uh, 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 this region here refused to allow anybody else to, they didn't want anybody else. They nominated me. They, when I got elected, they, they stood up and did the wave, you know, these kinds of things. And, uh, uh, and the, the superintendent had to say, uh, you know, let's, let's guard a little bit of decorum here. We are in serious business. And they, they didn't care. They didn't care. They, and, and they said, how did you get your region to love you that much they wanted to know and so I started to tell them some of the things that I've done and they said wow you're unique and I said thank you and I said thank you but the reality is is that every one of us are unique every one of us are different and when you are a novice and you still have all of these things in the future all of the plans for the future you can dream big dreams and this is what Mary was doing and this is what the other presbyters that are new into this and they're they're younger people and they're coming in they're saying we want to do something great for the Lord and so they're dreaming these big dreams Let's read the text of what Mary was, was uh, having as far as a reaction or, or uh, interaction with this same angel. It says in verse 26 of the same chapter, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So you could imagine that that is at least six months since Zechariah has spoken. Probably a little bit more because he had to finish his turn as the, as the priest, uh, go home. and uh, I mean, it, it could have been seven months at this point. And it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. The same one. Right? To, the town, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Sound familiar? Same thing that happened with Zechariah. The Gabriel isn't changing. It's the people that are changing. It says, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Now, some may read that and say that's the same thing that happened with Zechariah. That's not the case. Let me explain. Zechariah already knew the function of things and wanted proof. Mary here is doing something vastly different. You know why? Throughout the Old Testament, we had people that assumed they understood what the rule was. If Mary had not said, how will this be? She could have left that place and said, Joseph, an angel visited me. And by divine revelation, we need to have relationships early. She could have thought 
that God was going to use the normal sins of sorts of things and, and say, I guess I'm not, we're not supposed to wait till we're married because I'm supposed to have a baby. The truth of the matter is that would have been the first reaction, the first thought in her own mind. And we have people who hear God say, I want you to do this, and then they try to figure out how it's going to happen and then end up getting burned in the process because they never waited to say, God, how am I supposed to do that? So be very careful. So Mary is being very smart in her reaction here. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called Son of God. Now imagine that. Now all of a sudden she's not thinking about Joseph. She's not thinking about how it's going to happen. She says, all right, great, now I know. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. You know, the same thing is true about us. You are unique, and the things that God has planned for you, you may have allowed them to die a long time ago, just like Zechariah. And you think, I'm not praying about that anymore. When the angel shows up, when God himself shows up and says, I have this plan for you. I'm going to have you do this. But no plan of God, no word from God ever fails. I want to analyze a little bit the difference between these two. God used both of them, and their lives were changed forever. When you are used by God, your life will be changed. You're not going to be a carbon copy of the other, but you're going to become more like Jesus. Zechariah could not speak for more than nine months. Now, according to the law of Moses, if he was, had any physical defect and not being able to speak would be considered a physical defect, he wouldn't be able to serve as priest. He left an encounter with God and no longer had a job. Doesn't that sound like a blessing? Mary, also immediately after an encounter with God, ends up leaving. If you follow the text, she goes to visit Elizabeth and is there for at least three more months until the baby is born. She is told, she is told, God is going to do something great in you. She asks, how will this be? Thinking maybe Joseph has a part to play in this, right? And God says, no, it's through the Holy Spirit. And so she leaves. Now that could cause a lot of problems. If you're engaged to somebody and all of a sudden they just leave for three months and they show back up three months later and they're pregnant, you think, hmm, where have you been? You said you were in the house of these priests. Is that really what you're doing? But her life was changed. She had to leave her home, leave her fiancé, had to be in another place for months, for months. When God uses a person, he joins with them, and their life will never be the same again. If you notice, after the fact, Mary has this song that she's going to sing. After the fact of jo John's birth, Zechariah is prophesying, and his mouth is open. His he's able to glorify God, and God uses these individuals. Not in a way, perhaps, that they were hoping to be used, but God uses them because they're unique. They were different. They were different. Going on to another couple of people. Have you ever noticed that there was a great difference between Moses and Joshua? I'm reading in the Old Testament. I mean, there's a great difference. Now, if we talk about Moses, who was the first leader, and then Joshua, who's going to be the next leader. You know, they think, I want somebody like what we have. But this is what God chose. Moses grew up rich with the education of Egypt. We can recognize that, right? Moses grew up rich. Moses was a Levite. Obviously, he was of the same family as Aaron, his brother. He was a priest of that tribe, of that line. Moses became a shepherd after murdering somebody. And he spent 40 years training as a shepherd. But we can notice a couple of things about them. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, talking about Moses... It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is 
invisible. Invisible. So this was who Moses was beforehand. But he had plans. God had plans for him. And God can minister even amongst the rich. Jesus says how hard it is. But you know what? It can happen. Because Jesus' blood is sufficient. When his disciples asked Jesus, well, then who can be saved? Jesus simply says, for man, this is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. God can minister to anybody. Now, contrary to this Moses, who's a priest, contrary to this Moses, who is well-educated, here is Joshua. Joshua is a warrior. Joshua wasn't a Levite, but rather from the tribe of Ephraim. Joshua was one of the spies that went in. I have to tell you that to be a spy, you have to have a certain constitution. Because when you know that the whole world is going to kill you if they find out, if you just slip up a little bit, there's something about that character. To be a spy is not something that everyone is able to do. You may imagine in your dreams, but in the reality of life, you get so tense, you get flesh, you, you start to sweat, or whatever, if you're a spy. Mo Moses was this guy that could stand to be in the presence of God, but Joshua was a guy that could stand to be in the presence of the enemy. Joshua was a servant of Moses. Let's read a few things about Joshua. Joshua talking about him being a, a warrior uh, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Exodus 17. Uh, Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand up on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Moses was going to be safe, overseeing, and Joshua was going to go to fight. So Joshua fought the, fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up on top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. In other words, there were times when Joshua was losing. Moses never had to face that. When Moses' hands grew tired. They took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Also, have you ever noticed the difference in the way that God showed up to meet with them? You know, God meets us where we are. One of, one of the things that we know about Moses is that there's this burning bush, and Moses sees it, and it never goes away. It keeps burning, and it gets his attention. So he goes over to the burning bush, right? And when he gets before the burning bush, God says, Stop, Moses. You're walking on holy ground. Take your sandals off. And Moses has a face-to-face, -face, if you will, encounter with God. With God. Now, the same thing happens in Joshua's life. In Joshua chapter 5, it says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, now notice, to me, this seems like an odd place to have an encounter with God. Now let's analyze this. Moses, Moses, being a shepherd, likes a solitary life. In order for God to speak to him, he has to be in the middle of nowhere in a desert. For him to learn what the voice of God is like. But Joshua, by his character, by his nature, is a spy. And now here he is in the shadow of the enemy. He says, near Jericho. He's in the shadow of the enemy. And God comes to him there. And he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Now Joshua is the warrior, right? Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come now. So then Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? Now, in just a few moments later, and I don't have it on the text here in front of us, but then the angel, the God here is a theophany, says, Take off your sandals, Joshua. You're walking on holy ground. 
he has an encounter with God, but unique to who he is. Unique to who he is. Many times we think that God wants us to be a certain type of individual to be able to be used by him. But the reality is that God finds us and he created us the way we are in our uniqueness, in our quirkiness even, in our strangeness. There's some people that they, they like to read the love stories. Others like the adventures. There's some that are fascinated with how the, the uh, do-it-yourself uh, type of idea and figuring out how things go together, while others are involved in decorating. God creates us all in a unique fashion. God uses our abilities, and God even wants to use our weaknesses. Joshua, in his encounter there with, uh, with God, and he says, whose side are you on? Because Joshua is ready to fight. He's a warrior. He says, neither. Now, that's a little bit frustrating, isn't it? Because we often would think that God, if you come, you say, you're on my side. Joshua is going to lead the army in, and he's going to take the promised land. And he has the promise from God, I am with you. I am with you. No one will be able to stand against you. And over and over again, he has his promise. But when he comes face to face with, with God, he says, God, are you for us or against us? And he says, neither. And Joshua has to come to the conclusion God isn't wanting to come to our side. He wants us to go to his side. Even in our weaknesses, God can be made strong. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. We need to stop trying to be something or someone that we're not. I remember when I first started preaching. Oh, this, in two weeks from now, my wife and I are celebrating 29 years of, of wedded bliss. And I remember how many times she would tell me at the beginning, you know, you, you keep trying to preach like and she would use the name of our, our pastor that, that performed the ceremony of our, of our wedding. And I didn't think I was doing that, but she was convinced that I was. And so probably there was something that I was doing that convinced her of that. And as time went on, especially when I preach in Spanish, she doesn't notice that. But... We have to be who we are because God has made us who we are. There are some preachers that I know that use a lot of very sentimental stories. I was in one event and the person kept apologizing for using personal examples of their family. I thought, boy, I never apologize and that's all I do. When Matthew and Maida first got married, she was saying, boy, you use me in every sermon now. I said, yeah, you became part of the family. You're, you're fair game. <laughs> and we use these actual, I use these actual examples because that's who I am. I'm in relationship with these people. And I think that's important. If you don't think that's important, ignore those examples. But I'm not going to change because that's who God has made me. And God has made you in the person that he wants you to be because God wants to use us. God wants to use you. God wants to use me in a way that he can't use another. He can't use me in the way that he can use you. If you are the great interior decorator, he's not going to ever use me like that. I promise you. But he can use you in the way that you were designed. The reason God formed you the way that you are is because he had a need for you. And I want to challenge you to not be the Zechariah who had given up on the dream. Because God will come to you one day, and this may be the very day, and say, I've heard your prayers. So you say, I haven't prayed that in years. God may come to you and say, 
here I am. You say, are you for me or against me? Neither. You come on my side. God's going to show up and meet us where we are. And the reason for that is that he wants us to be transformed into his image. He wants us to be transformed into what he can use. He wants to use you, and you are the tool that is needed. But he's the one that has the experience, the expertise. Now here in Mexico, when I first came, I remember seeing the mechanics. My dad's a mechanic. And I spent a lot of time watching mechanics work. And... I was amazed at some of the mechanics, how few of tools they have. They don't have the right chisel, so they use a, ha a hammer and a screwdriver, you know? And my dad would never think about doing that. Now, I'd say, well, why don't you just use this screwdriver? He said, well, that would ruin the screwdriver. It has to have that point to it in order to take out the size screws that I, I take out. And he has all of these different screwdrivers, or at least had. He's retired now. I don't know if he still has them all or not. And I would look at him, and, and my dad would come down and visit. And he'd say, it's amazing. Here, you could be a mechanic with three tools. A crescent wrench, a hammer, and a screwdriver. And you're a mechanic. And I, I think, maybe we've, we've gotten to that impression with God. That all he needs is three tools. And he'll force us. No, that's not the case. He has very delicate tools, and he has very aggressive tools. The tools that uh, a, a contractor or a builder in Mexico are going to use, they're going to bring out this huge sledgehammer because they have to break rock to be able to make the, the foundation. This last week, because I had a problem, uh, halfway through the, the services, my phone would go dead because my battery was, was no good. I had to charge it three and four times a, a week. And so I ordered a new battery, and, and it came, the battery came with these little screwdrivers to be able to take apart the phone and replace the battery and, and put it back together again. Because every job requires something special. And you may not feel like it's all that important, the job, but I tell you that when everything is functioning the way it's supposed to, and today I could go back and forth and move this PowerPoint because my phone is working. And it was just a little tiny screwdriver that helped me accomplish that. And you and I are de de designed the same way. You may not know how you fit into the overall scheme, but God has heard your prayers. And he's going to provide because he wants to use you. And he is using you. Don't change who you are. Don't change your personality. Don't change your sense of humor. Just allow God to mo modify who you are into his image. Come over to his side with all that you are. And there was Joshua over on his side, a spy, warrior, that God says, now go and take the promised land. The same thing he's saying to you. Go, take the promised land, because he's chosen you. Bow your heads with me, if you will.